Jazzcast Pros. Welcome to Healthy Illness Podcast. I am your host, Kelly Marie. Healthy Illness is a podcast helping you build better relationships while living with mental health conditions. And today the conversation is centered around DBT, Dialectical Behavior Therapy. Blah. It's a mouthful, aka DBT. Once you have an understanding of what the different emotions are, you can begin to go through this process of assessing your reactions to the situation. And you can decide, you know, how do I respond? Like, what emotion is this and how am I going to respond to it? What better relationship is there to work on than the relationship to self? Like, subscribe and share. Do all the things. Let folks know that you're listening to Healthy Illness Podcast. So today's topic is DBT, Dialectical Behavior Therapy. It came about um, as a way to treat people with borderline personality disorder, which is a condition that I live with, as well as depression and generalized anxiety. And so DBT is a way to like reprogram your brain. That sounds kind of weird, but it is a way to help you reprogram yourself to be able to focus on today and to make better decisions based off of the information that you have at the time, as well as understand things like emotional regulation. So emotional regulation is huge for me, as well as many other people, because according to the science, what happens with someone like me that has BPD, borderline personality disorder, is that somehow you missed uh, the lessons associated with identifying emotions. It's usually centered around childhood trauma, but it could be, you know, other reasons as to why someone would have that kind of diagnosis. I do. I have childhood trauma and in permanent recovery mode. I think that that is just a thing that happens when you experience adverse childhood experiences and you are on the road to recovery. Like you're always in recovery mode. Back to DBT. My therapist um, that I'm working with now, we started doing another type of therapy but it only works when you are in touch with your emotions and able to like identify and scale emotions that you're feeling. And so we weren't able to continue on with that. It, it's on pause and it's on pause because I need to spend more time focusing on emo- emotional regulation. So I'm, I have reached a point in my journey where I don't have the emotional outbursts and instantaneous rage and a lot of signs of borderline personality disorder that I had in the past. But a part of my processing, I'm a very analytical person, is boxing up emotions and like putting them up on the shelf, which is fine if you go back and process the emotion. Otherwise, it goes up on the shelf and it it comes out as something else. And we talked about that, about stress, right? It's the same for emotions. Like They don't just disappear. They begin to live in your body in, in other ways. And so one of the ways to begin to process trauma, and that's what I've been working on, is to be able to identify the trauma and the emotion associated with that trauma. My inability to do that, again, has hampered our, our path in, in that direction of trauma work. But it has increased my focus on DBT, which I'm going back to to be able to work some more on my emotional regulation. And so what that means for me is that I reached a point using DBT, but I need to go back and start again and use those same tools again so that I'm fully processing emotion, that I'm able to attach emotions with traumatic events or just emotions to life in general. One of the things that I've done is like I'll watch other people's reactions and then identify what that emotion is in order to be able to then identify the similar emotion within me. For people that I'm close to, I've asked them what that thing is that they're feeling. Like, what do you describe this feeling that you're having 
right now. And so it comes off as more therapeutic, like I'm a counselor trying to, you know, therapize, therapeutize, therapeutize, therapeutize someone. But that's not it at all. I'm asking because I'm trying to figure out how this seemingly uh, normal human being is processing emotions and maybe I can learn from them if they can walk me through kind of what they're feeling in the moment. But it probably is creepy and honestly is not me then being focused on them as a person. It's me using our friendship to help me be a better person versus being there for that person. And so that was another lesson that I had to learn. A lot of lesson learning in these 46 years. But one of the things that I've been able to do is to be able to use DBT to help me explain what emotions look like. And so you might be asking, well, how does that work? I will tell you. I bought a workbook I'm going to share with you and we'll put it in the show notes. DBT skills training handouts and workbook by Marshall Linehan. It's super thick, lots and lots of pages, and it's broken up into a couple of subtopics. And one of those subtopics is emotional regulation. If you struggle, you know, I think this happens with people like not knowing what love is or what it looks like not understanding expressions of feelings. This uh, workbook or similar, you know, type of workbook may be beneficial because it, it breaks it down in a way that you can then teach yourself how to identify these emotions. And so one of the things that I love about how everything is broken down is when it, it comes to understanding what a particular emotion is, they have it broken down into several buckets, like many examples of events that have happened or an event that might happen that would cause a specific emotional reaction. Then the internal thought process interpreting that event, then the biological changes that the body feels, and then the actual expression or action that goes with that emotion and then the after effects like what it's like afterwards and so i thought it would be good to just give you an idea of um, how that works and what that looks like and how you can then begin to process some of your emotions and so what i've done in the past you know up until i you know started going through this re kind of um, understanding teaching process is i'll think through an action and i'll play out several scenarios to see which one i want to go with i don't know if everybody thinks that way or if you just do like you just react but my reactions are wild, right? Like that initial reaction I know is not good. So don't do that. Whatever that is, don't do it. Pause. Think about it. Pick one of your choices. And then that then becomes the reaction. And so some of it may feel scripted well, because it, it kind of is. And to be honest, it may not be, right? Because it's still a genuine reaction. I still feel the feeling, but how I choose to express the feeling is what changes. That's better. Yes, I like that. It makes more sense to me. I still feel the feeling, but my expression of that feeling changes. And that's a part of the regulation, right? Like every emotion doesn't get expressed the same way, right? Every emotion does not need a hammer, Right. So how do you give yourself time to pause and what list do you have? What steps do you go through to begin to know how to respond to a feeling? So we're going to talk about guilt, examples of events, right, that would prompt a guilty feeling or the feeling of guilt, then how the brain interprets that feeling of guilt, then the biological changes that the body goes through. So like, what does guilt feel like? Which is where I stumble. Like, I don't know how to identify the feeling itself, the biological change that I feel in my body. And then what the expressions look like, then after effects. So prompting events for guilt would be doing or thinking something you believe is wrong. So you're doing something that you think is wrong doing or thinking something that violates your personal values. So here are my personal values. I'm going to do something in contradiction to what I believe that may produce this feeling of guilt. Not doing something that you said you would do, making promises you don't keep. 
committing a transgression against another person. So again, violating someone like you, you have these personal values on interpersonal actions and you violate that, causing harm or damage to another person or object, causing harm or damage to yourself being reminded of something you did wrong in the past. Now tell me that people do not try and use your past to make you feel guilty like they do. And sometimes, you know, it can be beneficial to not be able to to understand what that emotion is or to work through it. You know, people have tried to make me feel guilty about things and like, I don't have no guilt about that. Like I I've, I've come to consensus with myself that there is no guilt to be had. Not all things, but especially when people try and use the past against me. Like, I'm not that person, but it is what it is. So those are the prompting events for feelings of guilt. So interpretations of events that prompt those feelings of guilt. So thinking that your actions are to blame for something. Thinking you behaved badly. So it doesn't even have to be an actual thing. It could just be the thought that the thing was bad. It didn't actually have to be bad. Right. But thinking that something was bad, if I had only done something differently, maybe you felt that. Right. Like if I only called more often or if if I only looking in the kitchen, washed the dishes, if I only fill in the blank with something, took that job or didn't take the job, they'd be prompt feelings of guilt. Um, Biological changes and experiences of guilt. So this is where it gets good to me, too. Like, what does guilt feel like in the body? Because the body we all experience emotions in, in many of the same ways, which is why we're able to name and emotion and agree on what that emotion is because we have the same biological responses. And so in this case, biological changes and experiences of guilt include a red and hot face. So embarrassment too will give you that, right? Jitteriness or nervousness, suffocating feelings, and then you may experience some other biological feelings associated with guilt. And what's cool is because it's a workbook, you can put in things that you know you personally experience that might not be listed. Expressions and actions of guilt. So trying to repair the harm. And we do that, right? We try and make things better. Let me go back and be a better friend or like me, be a better parent. Be How can I make up for the things that I've done that were I feel wrong or, or causing the guilt? So try and repair the harm, make amends for the wrongdoing, fix the damage or change the outcome. Asking for forgiveness, apologizing, or confessing. Gift giving, people do that a lot when they feel guilty. They start giving gifts and because some people refuse to apologize. Bowing your head or kneeling before the person. Again, when you think of how guilt is expressed, we still feel the same feelings, but cultures differ, right? And so we may express that feeling differently, even though we have those same biological changes. And then um, the after effects of guilt would be making resolutions to change, making changes in behavior, joining self-help groups, you know, promising not to do something again. That would be a resolution to change. Greetings, everyone. My name is Ra. Yes, I am the host of Father Torch. I would like to take this time to invite you in my discussions on very, very important topics of being a black and brown father in today's society. Being a parent, the other parent, we face trials and tribulations too. We have worries, we have feelings. Here at Father Torch, we promote the advocacy of being the dad you wish you had. Join me at fathertorch.com. Some words associated with guilt. So at the top of the page, they give you for all of the emotions, they give you different emotions that fall under that title. Guilt words include culpability, remorse, apologetic, regret, and sorry. I find it interesting. I'm thankful, I think, that the you know phrase sorry, not sorry became popular because it allows you to one, you know, express what people want you to feel sorry for. Like, sorry, that's an initial response that everybody expects you to be sorry for, but not sorry. Like, I'm actually not sorry for this thing. 
I don't use sorry, not sorry. I just try and respond and be who I'm going to be. But I do like sorry, not sorry. Other emotions have the same type of setup. And so you're able to go through and better understand what a feeling feels like, what a feeling looks like. You know, anger and rage is, is going to have different feelings, different manifestations, biological changes, uh, shame and love and joy. Like they're all going to have different physical feelings. And so again, we're talking about DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy. Once you have an understanding of what the different emotions are, you can begin to go through this process of assessing your reactions to the situation. And you can decide, you know, how do I respond? Like, what emotion is this and how am I going to respond to it? Giving yourself that time to pause to do that mental work may take time to get, you know, get to that place. Many folks are are quick to respond, quick to, you know, have that instantaneous reaction. And that five seconds to pause, listen, it can do you a world of good. Pausing saves lives straight up and relationships. And we're all about building better relationships. And so incorporating that pause through mindfulness, another DPT skill, helps you give yourself some space to be able to go through the steps in your mind of understanding what reaction or what emotion you're feeling. Um, Look at the situation and decide if the reaction that you're planning on matches the emotion. And then there's a range, right? Like you may have identified the emotion like guilt, but where is it on a scale of one to 10? Right. And so that's another place that I struggle uh, when I know what the emotion is. It's like, eh, it's a, you know, whatever. It's an emotion. So three, four, five, I don't know what it is. So being able to be more conscious of what I'm feeling when I'm feeling it and writing it down so that if I need to go back, which I do need to do, go back and review my emotions so that I can remember that feeling and remember that scale so I can determine how that will look in the future. And then how I can, I remember I I told you about the initial trauma therapy, being able to go back into the the trauma therapy. So that's where I am in my journey. And it's not an overnight thing. I don't know how long we're going to focus on emotional regulation. It is something that happens in waves. It happens in in phases. Uh, You master one piece of it and then you move on to the next piece. You master one level and you move on to the next level. And so you're always in the process of better understanding yourself and having better reactions to the emotions that you feel and then to give them the opportunity to be, to process, to just, you know, feel it. And so one of the other things that I wanted to talk about was the impact of emotions and how we feel them, um, the actual process of feeling the emotion. Maybe we'll chat about that next time. One of my questions to my therapist is, you know, because, it, you know, her thing is you feel the emotion, Kelly. And I'm like, yeah, how long are you supposed to do that for? Like how, how long they last? I need to know. But there is no pinpoint, but that helps my brain process the emotion. Like, okay, it's been five minutes. I should no longer be feeling this way. But there is no shoulds. Right? It, it is what it is. It's a process. And so how do we better go through that process and just let ourselves be and be better people along this journey? So until the next time, I want you to, if this is a thing you're interested in, look into emotional regulation. We'll put uh, the link to the book in the show notes. I don't get paid for this, y'all. Like This is just the book that I use. If you like it and buy it, I'm not getting any money from it, but this is DBT skills training uh, workbook and worksheets. And I have another book in the mail um, that my therapist, Jen, suggested. And so when that one comes in, I'll look that one over and, and see what that one's like. And we'll see which one's better. She is a professional, so hers might be better than what Google told me would be great. But I did my research. This this particular workbook and DBT skills section uh, and the author are experts in the field. 
I am appreciative that this book exists and gives me an opportunity to be a better me and to learn more about me. And what better relationship is there to work on than the relationship to self? And so this is a part of that journey, a part of the process. And thanks for hanging out with me and, and sharing this little piece of therapeutic growth that I'm, I'm experiencing. Hey, if you like this episode, check out Getting Real with Bossy, where we chat about what it's like to be a woman business owner. You'll hear interviews with women who are doing what it takes to succeed and the reality of what that looks like. We cover all the topics, figuring out the rules and regulations, navigating business partnerships, even if that's your spouse, motherhood while running a business, working within your values, and all the ups and downs of being the boss. Are you ready to get real? Pop over to our podcast, Getting Real with Bossy. Fantastic. So if you are in need of someone to talk to, you know, maybe you're in crisis or Maybe you're just having a rough day and, and you just need someone to listen. Feel free to call 988, okay? That is the line of crisis counselors. What may be a crisis to one person is not to another. You don't have to be in crisis to call. And if you need to call on behalf of someone, you can definitely call the crisis helpline as well. You can also text 741-741. We're not always in a position to speak, but, you know, texting may be the, the route that we need to go depending upon the situations we're in. So text 741-741 and you will get a crisis counselor that will respond to you, uh, real life human beings, and they will be able to help walk you through uh, whatever it is you're experiencing right now. If you're having a medical emergency or aren't sure what's happening with your body, dial 911, head to your nearest emergency room. And if you're looking for support, so you just don't know where to go, you can try 211. That's a national helpline. You can call for information on where to go, human services types of resources. You can call 211 or go to 211 in your browser and do a keyword search for more information. Until the next time, like, subscribe, and share. We're everywhere. Jazz Fast Pros Network. And I will see you in about a week. Be the light.